He lives. Amen? Amen. 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 Listen, right now, kids, sixth grade and below, you're dismissed the children's church. And let's turn in God's word to Genesis chapter 1. Genesis chapter 1. Before we dive in, let's, let's look to the Lord in prayer. Dear God, we are so thankful for your son who went to the cross, paid the penalty for sin, went to the grave, and rose again. Gave all who trust in him hope. Thank you so much, Father, for sending the Son. Son, thank you so much for coming. Holy Spirit, thank you for working through the Son. Dear God, you are so good. We celebrate your goodness. We celebrate who you are and what you've done and what you will do. And as we look into your word, God, we just pray, Lord, that you would increase our thanksgiving because we have come into contact with your spoken, your written, your breathed word. May you utilize it today to mold us, to shape us, to change us into the children you want us to be, into the representatives you want us to be. We look to you, God, in Jesus' name, amen. Last week, we started this series, and we focused in on the roles of men as displayed throughout the first three chapters of the book of Genesis, and the first thing that we saw was the value of men. We saw in Genesis 1, 26 and 27, that men are created by God, that men are made in the image of God, that the value of men is through the roof. Can the ladies all say amen? Yeah. How did your morning go? All right. Then we looked at the work of men. And God is a worker, amen? amen? He made all things, he sustains all things, and Romans 8, 28 says that he is working, working all things together for good. God is a worker, and as God's image bearers, as God's representatives here on earth, men are called, even before the fall, in the perfect garden, to work. And in the same way, men are called today to do the physical and to do the spiritual work as the Holy Spirit enables to care for God's creation, to lead and provide for their families, to lead within the church, and to lead or to work at representing God to the unbelieving community. And something I just briefly mentioned last week in regards to this, but I want to emphasize this right now. Men, due to our sin nature, on our own, we cannot do the work that God created us to do. We can't, due to our sin, fulfill the responsibilities we have to creation, to our wives, to our kids, to the body of Christ or to the unbelievers around us. We can't do it on our own. Isaiah chapter 64, verse 6 tells us that all our work is like filthy rags before God, unacceptable. But praise God, with Jesus Christ, we receive the Holy Spirit, and men, we have everything we need to complete the work that God calls us to do. 2 Peter chapter 1, verse 3 says, His divine power has granted to us all things that pertain to life 
and godliness. God has men made, made men to work for his glory, and with Christ, men have everything they need to accomplish that task. Last week in Genesis, we also saw the master of men, that God did not set Adam free in the garden to do whatever he wanted. No, in perfect paradise, Adam was called to obey. And the same is true today. Jesus said in John 14, 15, If you love me, you will keep my commandments. You will obey me. Now, just like work on our own, men, we can't obey God as he deserves to be obeyed. We can't treat him as the master that he deserves to be treated. But with Jesus Christ, we're filled with the Holy Spirit, and we can treat God as the master of our life as we were created to do from the beginning. Last week we also saw the need of men that just like it was not good for Adam, even when he was sinless, aside from Christ, the best man amongst all of us, even then he needed help. Will the women say amen to that? Amen. So God created what he called a helper suitable for him. And the same is true today. As God blessed Adam with Eve, God has blessed us men with the ladies in our life, enabling us, thank you, <laughs> enabling us to live the way God wants us to live. The last thing we focused in on was the headship of men. That prior to the fall, in the fall, and after the fall of man, man was made and called to lead. Not because he's superior, he's not. Not because he's more deserving, he's not. Not because he's more talented, he's not. Not because he's more valuable, he's not. Men were called to lead because that's the way God designed it from the beginning. This is why it says in the New Testament in regard to the marital relationship, it says in the New Testament, God says through Paul, now as the Christ Christ which I was the church, submits to Christ, so also wives should submit in their husbands to everything. So the same thing is said in 1 Peter chapter 3, the same thing is said in Colossians chapter 2, God wants men to lead in the marital relationship. When God talks about spiritually mature men in regards to the family, what does he say? When talking about elders who are supposed to be spiritually mature men, he says he must manage his own family and see that his children obey him with proper respect. So God wants men to lead in the marital relationship. God wants men to lead their family. In regards to the church, what does God say? In Titus chapter 1, he says that elders are called to be what? He says they're called to be the husband of one wife, a man, whose children believe and are not open to the charge of being wild and disobedient. The same thing is repeated in 1 Peter chapter 3. As established prior to the fall, in the fall, and after the fall, all the way into the New Testament and into today, men are created and called by God to lead, which is an absolutely colossal responsibility. One, as everything else on that board, you and I men cannot accomplish in the slightest on our own. Amen? But well, praise God, we're not alone. If we trust in Jesus Christ, we have the power of the Holy Spirit and we can fulfill that call of headship. Over the past couple of weeks, I've been doing a study on leadership with actually three groups. And on one hand, that study on leadership is just depressing. <laughs> Why is it so depressing? It's because as I look into it, all the areas of my failure in regards to leadership are just highlighted. And it's just like, ah. Oh. On the other hand, that study at the same time is so encouraging. Why? Because I get to see what God can make me through Jesus Christ and the work of the Holy Spirit. And that excites me. So that's just a brief review, maybe not brief, but 
review of what we saw last week. And now we're going to go into Genesis 1 through 3, and we're going to be bouncing around, and we're going to see specifically what God says about the role of women in the beginning. And the first thing we're going to see, it's going to be similar to the list we have here, is the value of women. Go ahead and look at first, or it's not first, but Genesis chapter 1, verse 27. He says, so God created man in his own image, in the image of God. He created her male and female. He created them. Women, you, like men, are a work of God. Amen. Can the men say amen? amen? This is, as you know, the Mona Lisa It is described, quote, as the best known, the most visited, over 8 million visitors go to see it every single year, the best known, the most visited, the most written about, the most sung about work of art in the world. It's protected, as you may be able to say, see there, by a bulletproof glass that's about two centimeters thick. It is the most well guarded. It is the most... Uh, well cared for piece of art in the world. Its current estimated value is just under one billion dollars. One billion! <laughs> Think about that. That's one billion for a work of a fallen, finite, largely forgotten man. Ladies, you are a priceless work of the all-perfect, all-powerful, always-relevant God of the universe. That painting is bottom-of-the-barrel garbage compared to your value. That's like used toilet paper compared to your value. I'm serious. I should have said used diaper. I was changing one last night, and it was ferocious. But anyways. <laughs> Ladies, you're so valuable that God the Father sent his only son, Jesus, to pay the price for all of your sin and your shame so that if you trust in him, you can spend eternity with him. Amen. Amen. What is God going to do with that picture? One day, that billion-dollar picture, God's going to burn it. But you, through faith in Jesus Christ, he's going to take and he's going to give you a room in his heavenly kingdom, in his mansion forever. Women, your value is through the roof. Second vital fact we see in this, similar to what we saw last week, is women, you are an image-bearer of God. As I said last week, kings, when this text was originally written, would take images of themselves and place them around their kingdom. Why would they do that? So everyone would be reminded who the king is, and everyone would be constantly thinking about who the king is. Those images were placed around kingdoms to point back to the king. Ladies, like men, you are an image bearer of the king meant to point all of creation back to God. To point to God in the way you speak, dress, think, and act. Our culture doesn't teach us that. Our culture teaches women to try and get all the eyes stuck on you. Right? Two weeks ago, Kimberly and I and the kids, we went to Kalahari resort in Sandusky, Ohio for the day. Why did we do that? We did that because they have an amazing, huge, awesome water park, and we wanted to go there for the day, so we went there, we rode all the rides, and on one hand, it was an absolute blast, but on the other hand, it was just heartbreaking. Why? Because the ungodly mo in modesty was absolutely insane. 
moms, young ladies wearing, it was like they had a competition of who could wear the least. There was at one point, I was walking down one of the pathways, my head finally like went up, and I was like, ah, is that person naked? Like, I just, I honestly didn't know. There was just seemingly no concept of the precious value or purpose that God has given ladies. It was just putting it all out there, you could say, for men to stumble over, get their eyes stuck on them, instead of the God they're supposed to be pointing to. It was heartbreaking. I mean, I've never looked at so much concrete and ceiling in my life. (laughs) I'm doing a study right now, every man's battle with a couple people, and one of the strategies is to bounce. I was bouncing up. I mean, but seriously, none of it pointed to God. None of it. Ladies, you're an image bearer. You're a representative of the king. Don't sell yourself like the culture tells you to. Don't speak, don't dress, don't act, don't think for your glory, to get the eyes stuck on you. Speak, dress, think, and act for God's glory in such a way that honors him, that points to his glory, holy and pure attributes. Casting Crowns has a great song that really relates to this called Only Jesus. It's talking about what's the point of my life? And the chorus of that song reads, I don't want to leave a legacy concerning looking a legacy that is all about me. I don't care if they remember me. I've only got one life to live and I'll let every second point to him. Only Jesus. Ladies, that's your role. And that's men, that's your role also, as we went over last week. That's why 1 Corinthians chapter 10, verse 31 says, so whether you eat or drink or whatever you do, do it all for the... Because we're image bearers. Now I said, I'm, you may have noticed, I'm walking through basically the same outline. Last week we focus on men, this week we focus on ladies. Um, Ladies, please try to remember that men are made in the image of God too. Just like you want to be, you, you deserve and you want to be treated with this value, you should seek to extend the same for men. And I'll be the first to admit, sometimes as a man, I don't act my value. Amen? Oh, good. That wasn't as many as I was expecting. (laughs) My wife has to put up with a lot of garbage. (laughs) Uh, But with Christ, can she treat me with the value that I am made with? Absolutely. She can, with Christ, exude the fruit of the Holy Spirit, and she can... Treat me with love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, and self-control. And when she does that, when she treats me according to my God-given value, what does that make me want to do? It makes me want to act according to my God-given value. It inspires me. More about that later. So we've just briefly touched on the value of men. Now let's look at the master, or excuse me, the value of women. Let's look at the master of women. Don't get too nervous. Turn to Genesis chapter 3 and look at verse 1. This can be seen clearly all throughout Genesis 1 through 3. I'm just picking these verses here. Genesis chapter 3, verse 1. In verse 1, Now the serpent was more, later we find out it's Satan, was more crafty than any of the wild beasts the Lord God had made. He said to the woman, Did God really say oh man, Satan's tactics haven't really changed much. He's always taking us to God's word and saying, did God really say that? You must not eat from any tree in the garden. Verse two, the woman said to the serpent, we may eat from the fruit trees in the garden, but God did say, you must not eat from the tree that is in the middle of the garden and you must not touch it or you will die. At this point, Eve is still sinless and she 
has a definite and clear understanding of who's in charge. She has a definite, clear understanding who the master is. As master, God has given her a command. And if she disobeys the command, there's going to be dire consequences, a.k.a. death. And if she obeys the command, she's going to continue to enjoy all the blessing of God. So prior to the fall and perfect creation, Eve was not free to do anything she wanted. She was made by God, under the rule of God, and largely that has not changed. Amen? Like men, all women still have a master named God that they will all answer to. A master to be honored, a master to be obeyed. If not, there are consequences. If yes, there is blessing. And like men today, ladies, you can't obey. You can't serve. You can't treat God for the master that he really is on your own. But you're not on your own. You have If you trust in Jesus Christ, Jesus is with you and you have the Holy Spirit and you are enabled by the Holy Spirit to live as you were created with God as number one. God is the master of your life. Ladies, please ask yourself today, is there any way or any area in your life in which it isn't clear that you have a master named God? Ask the Holy Spirit to search your heart. Ask the Holy Spirit to reveal any area where you're not acting like God's the master. Confess and then rejoice. Because through the Holy Spirit, he not only reveals, but he empowers us to follow him. So we have seen briefly the value of women, the master of women. Now let's talk about the work of of women. Go back to Genesis chapter 1 and look at verse 28. So after he declares that men and women are a creation of God, after he declares that men and women are an image bearer of God with absolutely through the roof value, verse 28 it says, and God blessed them And God said to them, be fruitful and multiply and fill the earth and subdue it and have dominion over the fish of the sea and over the birds of the heavens and over every living thing that moves on the earth. Notice the word them. And God blessed them. God said to them, God makes everything perfect and within perfection he gives the man and the woman responsibility. He gives them work to subdue creation, to rule over creation, to be fruitful and multiply. Turn back to Genesis chapter 2, or over to Genesis chapter 2, and look at verse 15. The Lord God took the man and put him in the garden of Eden to work it and to keep it. Then in the later verses, what does God give Adam? He gives him the helper that he needs, the helper suitable for him to complete the task that God has given him. God is a perfect worker, as I said before. He is the almighty potter that is shaping, working all things together for good for those who are called according to his purpose and his representatives on earth, men and women in varying ways within the roles God has given them, has called both to work. What is the area today, the most important area after your personal relationship with God, what is the most important area ladies are called to work in? It's the marital relationship. Ladies, you're called to work on your husbands. Amen. <laughs> to help, how? To help your husband... Draw near to Christ. How? What's the God-prescribed way for helping a husband draw near to Christ? I don't think it's nagging. I don't think it's by belittling them. I don't think it's by throwing their role out the window and saying, I'll take charge, I'll show you, I'll drag you into what's proper. 
Turn in your Bibles to 1 Peter chapter 3, please. What's the God-prescribed way to perform the most important work that ladies have in regards to their marital relationship, helping their husbands draw closer to God? What's the God-prescribed way? What's going to bring about real heart change? 1 Peter chapter 3, verse 1. Wives, likewise, submit, be subject to your own husbands. Now, that word likewise at the beginning, that's really important. Your text may read this way. It may read, wives submit in the same way. Well, what's it talking about when it says same way? What's it talking about when it says likewise? You just turn the page backwards, and who's it talking about? It's talking about Jesus. It's talking about how Jesus submitted to God the Father and went all the way to the cross. And what was the product of his submission? Salvation? Good? Right? So, 1 Peter chapter 3, verse 1, wives submit in the same way, like Jesus did to God the Father, so that, that's interesting, why do that? So that even if some do not obey the word, they may be won without a word by the conduct of their Wives, when they see the purity and reverence of your lives. Now, in the upcoming weeks, we're going to get more into, more into this, but just look at that for a moment. According to God, who's speaking through the Apostle Peter at this moment, what's the God-prescribed way to work on to help your husband grow in belief, or your text may say obedience to the word? How are you going to get your husband closer to God? The answer is Christ-like submission. And to, one, to that, one may say, well, that's never going to work. <laughs> I'll nag him. I'll, I'll bring it out of him. I got some sharp words to say. I'll push him into it. I'll take charge. That behavior never works. It's not God prescribed. In fact, Proverbs chapter 21 verse 9 says, It is better to live in the corner of a housetop than in a house shared with a quarrelsome wife. We snicker at that verse, but that's still God's word, right? So the Proverbs 19, 13, the contentions of a wife are continual dripping. I don't think that's too helpful. What's going to bring about the God change in your husband's heart? How are you going to work to bring that about? This is the way. For several years, Kimberly has wanted to adopt. She saw the call of Scripture to take care of God's orphans, feeling that God is leading her, wanting to adopt. She sees the opportunity. I mean, there's so many varying different ways to help orphans and perhaps and specifically adopt. And she saw how God, you know, the money thing's not an issue when God's in it. She saw all, all of that, but honestly, I didn't see that. I saw the call in Scripture to take care of the orphans. I really didn't see the opportunity, and I really did not see how God would ever provide. You know, adoption, that type of thing, that's expensive. And she'll tell you that she hounded me on this for quite a while. She even took charge and took me to a few meetings, saying, this is what we're going to do. And you know what? None of that worked here. None of that worked here. All it did was Proverbs 19, 13. And just make me angry. But today I do see the call in Scripture. And today I do see the opportunity. And today I do see how God could easily provide. And I am wanting and pursuing adoption. What changed this loser right here? 
a couple months ago, Kimberly leaned over to me in bed and said, I don't remember the exact words. I tried to, I tried to remember them exactly, but this is the gist of it. John, you know what God's word says, and you know my heart. I want more kids, and I long to adopt. You know my heart. You've listened to my reasoning, and with no remorse, no regret, no bitterness whatsoever, I will submit to whatever you decide. Please pray, lead, and I will follow. And boom. Doesn't always happen that way. But that time it did. And right here, and right here, started to change. Through Kimberly's Holy Spirit field, hard work, and it is hard work, of Christ-like submission, God drew me, changed me. Just this past week, I talked to a husband who told me that God used his wife to bring him to this church and back to Christ. It wasn't through pushing, it wasn't through complaining, it wasn't through demanding, it wasn't through taking charge. None of those things were utilized to change his heart. It was this. He was, as the text said, won over. Won over by the submissive behavior of his wife when he saw her purity and reverence for God. Won over. Ladies, you are called to a very difficult job. You're called to work on us men specifically husbands, and the way God has prescribed is Christ-like submission. Ladies, you're also called to work on your kids. That's easy. <laughs> Proverbs chapter 11, or 1 verse 11 says, Hear my son, your father's instruction, assuming there's father's instruction, men are leading, but, and forsake not your mother's teaching. She's right there with the husband, helping Guiding, teaching, same thing is repeated in Proverbs chapter 6, verse 20. We can turn to Deuteronomy and it says, Raise all, everyone in the admi- all your kids in the admonition of the Lord. And that is easy. I don't think I'll get any amens for that. And I shouldn't because it's really hard. Titus chapter 2 tells us that older ladies are to teach younger ladies to be workers at home And that's not saying that a woman can't work outside the home. What it's communicating is the focus. You have a focus, ladies, on your husband and bring him to Christ. And the focus is on my kids, the home, the family, bringing us all to Christ. That's the focus. And that is a difficult task. But ladies, you, just like men, are not alone. You have Christ You are empowered by the Holy Spirit, and we, men and women, can fulfill these roles. So we have seen the value of women, the master of women, the work of women. Now let's talk about the position of women. Look at Genesis chapter 2, verse 18, or turn all the way back there. Genesis chapter 2, verse 18. It's reinforced in verse 20, and he says to Adam, or he says, makes a blanket statement, I will make for him a helper fit for him. Helper is literally translated one who helps, a help mate, someone to help the man glorify and live for God together. And you know what? That's pre-fall language. That's pre-curse language. That's what God designated in chapter 1 as very good. There is a lead, there is a help of equal value, different roles. Let me say it this way. Prior to the fall in Genesis 2, the woman was made, as is clear, after the man, right? And one may say, well, that's not a big deal. Like, order, does that really matter? Well, it does. It does matter because... That is one of the reasons, the first reason that God gives concerning this command through Paul. So it means something. It communicates first, it communicates 
headship within the relationship. It means something, or else it wouldn't be there. In Genesis chapter 2, verse 18, it tells us that the man was made, the woman was made for the man. Well, is that really a big deal? The woman was made for the man? Yeah, it's a big deal because we turn to 1 Corinthians chapter 11, and this is one of the reasons for male headship in 1 Corinthians chapter 11 in the church. So it's important. He's communicating roles, not value, not demeaning. He's saying this is the role of man, this is the role of ladies. And we see the same thing repeated and emphasized in passages like these. In Genesis chapter 2, verse 22 and beyond, it says the woman was made from the man, brought to the man, and named by the man, all communicating, and we could go to multiple New Testament scriptures, all communicating the man has a responsibility to the lead and the woman has the responsibility to help him at it because he needs it. This is why it says in 1 Corinthians chapter 11, verse 3, I want you to understand the head of every man is Christ, and the head of the wife is her, and the head of Christ is God. Let me say it this way. Um, in light of that verse, prior to the fall, prior to the fall, God creates men and women in his image to display him, to display him, and he does that by creating them differently, with different roles, right? Right? Just like God the Father and Jesus Christ are one but different roles, especially within the salvation plan, right? Before the fall, God planned what? He made the salvation plan. Ephesians chapter 1 tells us before the foundations of the world, he makes the salvation plan. And in the salvation plan, who's the head? God the Father is the head. God the Father sends the Son. The Son only, the Gospels teach us, only says and only does what the Father tells him to do. Nothing more, nothing less. So within the salvation plan of God, made before, before creation, when there's no sin, he's saying within the Trinity, there's headship. Father, Son, Holy Spirit. The Son practices headship over the Holy Spirit. He sends the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit obeys. So what does the relationship of men and women do? It exudes. It exalts. Men and wife, or man and wife, or husband and wife. I got corrected at a wedding for saying man and wife. It's husband and wife. Sorry. Ex nafe. Cut that out. Anyways, so you have... The man exercising headship, the woman in a position of submissiveness, helping, and what is that all pointing to? It's all pointing to the Trinity. It's all pointing to God and how within the Trinity, he functions. So ladies, this role that this is displaying is not a lowly role. It's a God displaying role. It's not a lowly role. It's a God-displaying role. Now turn to Genesis chapter 3, verse 15. After Adam fails to lead in the battle with the serpent, and the woman takes the lead, and they both sin, what does... God say to the woman, what is the punishment that he exudes on the woman? Verse 16, excuse me, verse 16, yes. He says, to the woman he, God, said, I will surely multiply your pain in childbearing. In pain you shall bring forth children. Your desire shall be contrary to your husband." but he shall rule over you. Now, the literal translation of that verse reads, your desire, shall be, your desire shall be for your husband, but he shall rule over you. The ESV throws the word contrary in there, 
Why does the ESV throw the word contrary in there? Well, this is the explanation. This word for desire or desire shall be contrary is only used three times in your entire Bible. It's used in the Song of Solomon to describe what? It's used in the Song of Solomon to describe sexual desire. The sexual desire of a wife for her husband. Now let's take that definition and throw it into this sentence. Your sexual desire shall be for your husband, but he shall rule over you. That doesn't fit the context at all. This is a punishment. This is not a good thing. This is a bad thing. And sexual desire was created when? Prior to the fall. God told Adam and Eve to be fruitful and multiply. And when he said that, he wasn't talking about farming. He wasn't talking about mathematics. He was talking about the beautiful union between man and woman that he designates as very good to be enjoyed by the man and woman. So sexual desire of a woman for her husband is not a result of the curse. It was there before the curse. So we can't take that meaning into this. You can't do that. In the New Testament, what is the marriage bed called? It's not called the curse. It's called peer. It's called holy in God's eyes. This is not Eve being cursed with a sexual desire for her husband. How else is this specific Hebrew word translated, desire, or desire shall be contrary, where else is it used in the Bible? Turn the page to Genesis chapter 4. Almost the exact phrase is used. And remember that phrase in Solomon, Song of Solomon? That's written almost a thousand years later. This one's written at the same time. Here we go. Genesis chapter 4, verse 6. The Lord said to Cain, Genesis chapter 4, verse 6. The Lord said to Cain, why are you angry and why is your face fallen? If you do well, you will, will you not be accepted? And if you do not do well, sin is crouching at the door. Now look at the next or last phrase of that verse. Its desire is contrary to you, but you must rule over it. Literally, its desire is for you, but you must rule over it. God is saying to Cain, sin's crouching at the door. And what does sin want to do for you? Does it want to have a sexual relationship with you? No, it wants to take you over. Obviously not in a good way. That's why the ESV adds the word contrary. God is saying sin does not desire a good thing from you. It's crouching at the door. It's like a weed. It just wants to grow, 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 take over, take over, take charge. But God tells Cain to do what? He tells Cain to do the right thing, right? Sin's crouching at the door. Sin wants to take over. What does he tell him? Tells him to do the right thing, to rule over it. Now, with that phrase, which is almost the exact Hebrew phrase, Go back to Genesis chapter 3. Verse 16, second half. Your desire shall be contrary to your husband, or your desire shall be for your husband, but he shall rule over you. The punishment on Eve and subsequent is this. She will want to rule her husband, especially due to the sin nature and all the failures of leadership. Like she took the lead with the serpent, she will want to take the reins in the marital relationship and lead. But in the end, will it work? Will God's roles designated at the beginning be fulfilled or be overtaken? No, he says, but he will rule over you. This is a succinct statement. The helping role of the woman is not initiated by the punishment of God. It was made more difficult like man's work in the subsequent verses, and reinforced by the statement, he will rule over you. And to all that, one may say, I absolutely don't buy any of this. I just don't accept it at all. I think when Jesus came, he removed the curse and got rid of this whole roles thing that I still think was initiated at the fall. There's a big problem with that. What's the problem? Well, if that were true, Christian women 
would have way different pregnancies. Right? I mean, look at verse 16. Part of the curse is what? Pain in childbearing. If the roles of men and women are initiated by the curse and eliminated by Jesus, that has to be part of the deal. But let me tell you from personal experience, it's not. Not for me giving birth. Don't say that. I don't have that emoji on my phone. All right? Kimberly's giving birth to five kids. She's a strong believer in Jesus Christ. And for everyone, I was in the room, and she gave me that look. <laughs> you did this to me! <laughs> when Levi was born, or was it, Le which one was it? <laughs> David, I think it was, she's like, you know, I'm doing this one, no drugs. If I tell you I want them, don't give them to me. And then about, it's too late for drugs, there's a certain time period, you can't do it, and She's about to give birth. He's like, why did you give me that? <laughs> so one of the reasons you can't say that roles are a result of the curse and when Christ comes into the picture, they're all eliminated is because Christian women still experience pain in childbirth. Can I, give it a, can I get an amen for that? Yeah. And another reason you can't say that is because after Jesus Christ comes back, he has the apostles write 1, Timoth 1 Peter chapter 3. He has them write Colossians chapter 2. He has them write Ephesians chapter 5, which all do what? Reinforce the roles that God initiated before the fall. This punishment on women here did not initiate roles, nor was the punishment on women eliminated by Jesus. The roles of men and women were a part of God's perfect creation. The fall was a failure to stay in part in those roles. The punishment on women was more difficulty in keeping her role, along with difficulty in childbirth. What Jesus has to offer to all ladies on the planet is the ability to grow out of that desire that is contrary to their husband. Gives the ability, growing in the ability to function within the roles that God's designed. Continually grow in that. Become perfect at it? No. But continually grow in it. You know, I asked my wife about this. <laughs> it's like, this is what I'm going to say. What do you think? And this is not an exact quote, but it's pretty close. She said, John, I am so sick of people telling me to be less or to be more than what God says I am. I want to function with Christ the way God made me to. When I don't, I am miserable. But when I do, I am joyful, and there is joy in my house that the world can't come close to offering me. Don't you dare rob any woman of that joy. Preach the word. Yeah. This is really hard for us. The culture says this is bigoted, this is sexist. This is wrong. But it's the complete opposite. It's God's word. It's the truth that sets us free. One application. The application is pray for the potter to mold us, to mold me, to mold you in accordance with his word. For us to submit, for us to say, God, make of me what you want of me in regards to the role of women and in regards to the role of men. God, you're the potter. I want to be shaped by you. Let's pray.
Dear God, thank you so much for your word. Thank you so much for your spirit. Thank you so much for the body of Christ. Thank you so much for giving us all the privilege of being your created beings, your image bearers. We get to represent you. We get to point everyone to you. Thank you, God, so much. We pray this all in Jesus' name. Amen.